Okay, so I'm just going to start. From the intimacy of salt on skin to the salt of the Atlantic that separates families on the continent and in the diaspora, from the axis of a father and that father then dying to becoming a father and thus an axis to, in three children's lives, to the axis of the political, the historical, and how it is still the steady spinning upright core at the center of our lives in the present. One can read Ni's entire collection as a spinning gyroscope. The intimate, the familial, the political, the historical spinning around a single central axis without each, disrupting each other's paths. But what is the central axis, the steady upright core around which these themes spin? The gaze brings us inside the poet's mind and heart and allows us to touch to taste, to smell and feel what it is like to move through the world from the axis of his perspective. African and diasporic, son and father, lover, cousin, writer, male, multilingual, musician. The poet takes us into the center point of a range of spectrums, probing and teasing out the places where polarities meet. And he does so through and with this most vulnerable and triumphant of inventions, the human body and its senses. This book asks us what are the things in our lives that turn around and on each other. And as everything around us spins and moves and is also linked to everything else, what is the steady spinning core that keeps us upright? In the poem Crossroads versus the Blues, Ni nee offers that maybe the world spins around the blues legend Ma Rainey. See, I'm hard to pin down. Quote from the poem. See, I'm hard to pin down. I'm slip, I'm slipper as a spinning specter. Why go to the crossroads when the world spins around my center? So Ni, nee, um, I have structured this evening's launch. Um, in the same form as a gimbal. So we're going to move from the Wonderful. logic theory wow. reason into the core slash the turn, and then we're going to move into emotion and feeling. So there are three sections um, that are roughly, I hope, 15 minutes. I fear that I might have been overeager and tried to do too much. So I'm going to try. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to keep watching the time. Um, yeah. So Can I just say I, I love that? <laughs> like how you've, conceived it and yeah i'm i'm honored <laughs> yeah so yeah, now I mean, i'm in your hand the book, the book inspired it so i'm gonna start um, by asking you to read the poem of serendipity for us and we'll start with we're starting with structure so logic theory reason being structure and gimbal so if you could read of serendipity of serendipity mm -hmm. you know it's interesting that you ask because this is actually the first gimbal poem i wrote ah wow is the absolute first gimbal poem I wrote because okay. um, it was such a difficult thing to write and I finally got there. But anyway, I will read it um, of serendipity. Cybernetic serendipity was a phrase invented for me by my father, an easy source of laughs when a child can't shape his soft C's or R's properly but a priceless gift for his vocabulary. Later, he would explain gyroscopes as objects with a steady core, their orientation maintained with the help of outer gimbals that spin. I never asked what happens if gimbals break, if a heart's constant tread is unbalanced by a break in the body that holds it. What happens when serendipity dictates that cancer is a hammer that knocks gimbals out of shape. Mm. What I know is I was out delivering newspapers. The weather was icy as death. I felt my father depart at the traffic light. I raised my handlebars and tried to force my way through the red to my own demise. Horns blared like a final chorus, but my unbroken gyroscope stayed true. Sure. It's a whole other thing, um, hearing it read in your own voice. And just in my own kind of annotations, I've highlighted 
the three lines, which are mm. the terms, and I'm going to ask you to break that down for us in a minute, but I just want to read them on their own. Yeah. Gyroscopes as objects with a steady core by a break in the body that holds it. The weather was icy as death, I felt. How those three can become a poem on their own. Mm. So you've created this new form, the gimbal, inspired by your physics background. So I, can we just start there? What is the form? How does it work? And why did you create it? Um, I created it to deal with these heavy emotions, to, to kind of give them something to hang on. Um, and I didn't know I was creating it when I was creating it. I was struggling with a poem and I needed to breathe in the poem. And I found that these single lines gave me a pause, a place to breathe, to gather my thoughts and to move from, let's say the mundane things that we do. So in Ghana, when somebody dies, when people come to your house, you have to tell them over and over again what happened, right? So that becomes mechanical. It's almost a science, it's, it's, it's a ritual. So sometimes that delays your grief. You, can't, you don't get to it until later. And so the, the form mirrors that in the sense that it's got a fairly logical opening. And then it, by the time it gets to the middle, you've got to the point where you have to start processing your emotions. The emotional part has to come through. And it's also the center because this is where you have to make the break between society and yourself or what is expected and what you need. Um, and so for me, that's the turn of the gimbal um, of the poem, um, the core. And, um, and then it moves into emotion. And so it, the form literally came together right in this very poem which I wrote in so many different ways and it just didn't feel right until I settled on this um, particular form with the five lines and then the line to rest and then the four lines almost to kind of regather yourself and then the kind of line of realization of okay this is where I am okay so I need to speak I need to pause and I need to speak and we're done. And that's essentially, you know, um, obviously the poem kind of explains what gimbals are, <laughs> um, you know, so gyroscopes are these wonderful um, objects um, I've always been fascinated with. So it's really weird. <laughs> um, but I also probably because my father told me I like gyroscopes when I was quite young. Um, but it's that thing of seeing something spin and not stop, which is almost a metaphor for life, right? Because we're figuring things out all the time, but you don't have the luxury of stopping because time is a constant tread. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the most um, non-technical <laughs> um, explanation mm -hmm. of the form. But you know, like all forms, it comes to be through emotion mm -hmm. and then the technical explanation comes afterwards. You know, So mm -hmm. when I wrote that um, piece on Twitter, it was me kind of synthesizing what it meant because I, I was then realizing these transitions mm -hmm. um, from the logical to the emotional. Um, I mean, I love that, that the form emerged in a way, as opposed to this thing of um, setting out from the outside in to create something. It's kind of working from the inside out. And so then what was your experience when you went to work with it again? Did you find it as easy and the reason I ask is, um, having written one, I the thing I love about it is that it feels restrictive and at this and contain it feels restrictive, and containing and containing both in the holding way and in the holding back way, mm -hmm. and at the same time there's something about that that opens things up. Yeah. And so, what was your experience when you went to work with it a second and a third time when it wasn't kind of emerging by itself? How did you find working with that? process so it was new in the sense that I had a sense of where I was going mm. but it didn't change the emotional honesty that I needed to face it the, the thing that I love about the gimbal I, at least for me I cannot write it without confronting my emotions 
Mm. And I think that's because of the turn. You know, you have to find that turn mm. where there's a separation between, look at what I can do with my logic, with my language, and mm. look at what I need to confront to live. Because it asks you that question that line in the middle that tells you that you have to switch between logic and emotion also tells you you have to stop playing games, right? And so for me, it's always a difficult experience, but it's, it's a more familiar experience. It's almost like being a parent, you know? Every child is different. Even if you've had a child before, the next child comes along and you have to figure it out. <laughs> and it's, it's a bit like that. Thank you. I'm so glad we're recording this because you're saying so many things that like we all need to go back to. It's like as as one of, as one of the young poets I work with says, you're saying quotable things. <laughs> so yeah, just yeah. things that we can go sit with. Um, and then just this last question of structure: Can you talk a bit about the structure of the book? You know, the different sections: game, mm. eros, o, oh, zest. Mm. Um, that come together to make up this whole, the gaze. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? So, um, you know, one of the things I, I, I always teach and, and kind of profess to, to my students is the importance of writing being pleasurable. So I wanted to start the collection with play and that's what game is. Mm -hmm. um, as much as there are very emotional poems in there, there are also poems in which you have to kind of explore form or, mm -hmm. or I'm talking about actual games like sports. Um, so I, I wanted to do that. As much as I struggle with the gimbal, there's a great pleasure when I get there because there's a huge catharsis. And so for me, there's, there's, there's an immense pleasure in writing one. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard journey, but it's like a, it's like a road trip, you know? <laughs> You, you're going to get there and you're going to have fun. And, and I think that's what it is. Um, so I, I really wanted to start with that. And then from there, it felt like it was a natural transition because it was still dealing with emotional things to go into eros, love, because I guess, yeah, a kind of reflection of my own life. Um, I was a very playful kid that became aware of his emotions as I grew up, right? And, and so the book kind of follows that. And then O is um, gossip. It's about things that kind of shoot off and meet and, you know, there's a, there's a chaos, but there's an order that comes as well, um, which I feel is a bit like, again, how you navigate, how friendships are formed, for instance. Most friends that you have, you don't actually know the moment when you became friends, right? You know the moment you met, but you don't know the moment when it became comfortable to go to them to say, hey, I'm struggling, right? And that was that part for me of, oh, it's just like, and it sounds like O as well, <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I, there's lots of things I'm playing with. I'm playing with sound of even the title, the gaze, um, spelled differently, mirroring the, 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 the script for um, the Amharic language. So kind of rooting it in Africa um, with the photograph, again, kind of playing games with the gaze. Um, so there's a lot of play that runs through it, but it slightly um, shifting in each section. And I think our connection with the contemporary world, with contemporary culture, this is the point where we're probably at the first part of the gimbal, where we can be, um, we can explore the things that we've come to know in the world and play with them and not necessarily be emotional, but be political. And I think that's the final section where I've moved outside of myself to, the the interface between myself and the world and i think that's yeah that's pretty much the structure thank you um can i ask you to read as we kind of close off the section on kind of structure um to just read a gimbal of blackness of course 
It's a difficult one for me to read, but um, I guess that's why we write them, right? Um, <laughs> so it's a very difficult one at present because the aunt I speak about, the well-meaning aunt in the poem, um, died slightly less than two years ago. And just over a week ago, her husband died. And that's mm -hmm. who I, I live with um, over here in London. So anyway, a gimbal of blackness for Pops. Night cannot grasp the swift flight of wind, but blackens every tree the air moves, paints them darker, pushes them against the light, the shapeless light that gives them shape to shift before my eyes. I am often in the embrace of night. I am myself a dark thing, the kind that was once called boy when man, that was born of a woman descended from hills and a man delivered from boyhood by the sea. A man now lifeless, though he gave me life. I am often in the embrace of dark thoughts, in the dim grasp of memory, a bottle in hand, reflecting the light of the moon. I recall a can of Guinness left in a London fridge, when my father bought, but didn't get to drink, kept for me by a well-meaning aunt, and how hard my throat shrank with every sip, how sharp that smooth black liquid felt inside me, how hard these nights that blackened me, broken with grief for a man I loved who can no longer grieve. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I resonated so much of that. I think it was that poem that kind of pulled me into writing the gimbal. It's the one that you shared on Twitter. Yes, it was the the, the original shared gimbal poem, but it was mm. the second one I wrote. Mm. So yeah. Um, so yes, like that thing, it was actually harder to write in some ways than the first one, mm. um, even though it's about the same subject, mm. um, but it's slightly more expansive and it's more, it's, it's more about the grief that endures, that comes yeah. back for you, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because um, I, there were two reasons the poem struck me. I lost my mother a few years ago and I ended up writing a gimbal that was about that experience. And so, mm. and so there was something about the way in which you dealt with it that just on so many levels kind of resonated. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm aware of time, but I'm also just <laughs> going to keep going. <laughs> no, but you're doing well. Um, so moving to this notion of the, the core and the turn, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm going out on a limb to say, I'm going to share what I read as the core and the turn, mm -hmm. and it might not be what others do. And I think the beauty of this book is that each of us will find for us what the core and the turn is for us. And so I'm going to quote, I can't remember which poem this is from, I forgot to write it down. I'm going to just quote from three different poems. One, thus the body is echo chamber and memory, all its parts, triggers, every bruise, history, melody. And then from a concise geography of heartbreak from the section physical, you will compose an anthem and sing it like an orgasm. And then from the poem, our love is here to stay. The secret is to listen to the slow creeping embrace of the trumpet's protest, the percussive defiance of the piano's syncopation, the indrawn breaths, the song learns the body that it sings, that sings it. I want to say that everything in this collection turns on the, on the experience of being in the body. The yeah. words brow, breastbone, collarbone, sweat, spit, suck, chest, goosebumps, lips, tongue, kiss, caress, and numerous others are in every corner, crevice, and breath of this book. The body is the way through which we experience love and intimacy in all their forms. The body is the way through which our histories are still alive in the present. 
but I feel like you are not writing about the body as so many kind mm. of poets do. You take us inside it, you give us a visceral experience. And that really struck me and it stayed with me because it draws us in and it makes us able to touch and feel every moment and idea. And so what I'd like to ask is if you could please read Caress. I'm going to have to um, just ask you to read Caress one because we're short because of time. Okay. <clears throat> Caress. One, caress. If I speak often of gardening and days slow rise behind the creep of morning sun, it is because somewhere along my thigh lies the memory of a tomato plant's jagged leaf, nibbling at my skin at dawn, your hand steady at my shoulder, your voice gentle in my ear, pointing out tiny buds that will turn to flower, then fruit. I hold the faded watering can, its silver sharp against my grip, dark as yours, as we wade between beds of onion and kale, lettuce both green and red, aubergines that stand high as my chest, and all the while, time unfurls. Birds bicker in the guava tree behind us, doors crack open, the light spreads, it's lost the caress in your tight curls as you pull a radish clean out of the soil, shake it and bite through its red skin to the crunch of its white flesh, passing one half to me. We speak nothing or comfort of origins, but I know you planted all these seeds and taught me the tender and the harsh, the art of nurturing them. And this is all I needed to know of love ever, a morning before sun, the beauty of bud, flower, and fruit, a father's voice with bird song, the tart white secrets in a radish's heart. Thank you. This is a poem that was really fun to write. Um, because it shifts quite a lot. And that's, I guess, the, 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 um, the section O has that um, kind of latitude to jump. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Thanks. Um. And so was writing through the body in such a visceral way an intentional choice? <clears throat> I don't know that it was an intentional choice. Maybe it's just the way that I experienced the world. Mm. Um, I am very much in tune with my body. I mean, um, I'm rarely ill. Mm. And that's because when there's a weakness coming, I get cravings. And I eat stuff. And, you know, so I, I think there is a part of me that's very in tune mm. with my body. When I was a kid um, growing up in Ghana, I would be in a room and I'd turn to a corner and I'd see an ant. Literally the only other living thing in the room, I would spot it. Um, and I just had experiences like that all the time. And so I think my experience of the world is very much to do with being in touch with my senses and when I'm when that's numb then I, I don't feel like myself mm. yeah it's yeah. also why I don't like wearing being in England because I have to wear jackets all the time <laughs> and then I feel like there's there's a barrier between me and the world yeah. Um, yeah 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 sure that's yeah that's really it, it's um it's really felt in the work mm. um because I think, you know, when you experience poems, you can feel when someone's trying at something versus when someone's living something through a poem. Yeah. And there's definitely a sense of living through and it feels like we're right there with you in every, in every breath, in every moment, in every um, realization. It feels like we're kind of standing next to you, you know, as yeah. we read them. Thank you. I think so it's what? probably because I'm also going through the realization as I'm writing it. Uh, <laughs> so... 
yeah. yeah. as poems I want to do. <laughs> and so then the next question around this notion of um, uh, body is, and the visceral, the word and the theme of salt also keeps spinning back around. Mm. And so I want to read a few, um, and I use spinning intentionally, salt as mineral, salt of the body, salt of the ocean. Mm. And I want to just read a few kind of um, instances I found and I'm going to read them and, and then ask you to answer why salt. Okay. So from the poem, One Night We Hold, two bodies moved by hands to the melting point of sodium. We are salt separating into its elements. We are Lot's nameless wife reclaiming our story. If nobody else looked back, everything is a rumor. We are sweat without words. How it feels is a held breath. And then um, from the poem that's 35% written in Ga, so I cannot pronounce the title. Country Akashwe. Add not salt to my pain. Mm -hmm. From the poem Bottle, terrified of seeding hopes I could not suckle, the salt charred taste of her rum that smolders still in the back of my throat. From uh, 11 page letter, the sea between us is common salt. From defenses, how you can never tell how much salt hides in a tear or a drop of sweat without letting it ride the ridges of your tongue. And if the heart pumps blood and blood is 92% water, how much salt or sour a heart? Why salt? Um. I wish there was a logical reason for it. <laughs> um, I, I, I can only say that we are affected by things in ways that we, we don't realize, only in hindsight. If you, I mean, I know there's a bit of salt in there, but when you're reading, I just think to myself, that's quite a lot. But I am, <laughs> I am from, a, from a family um, that were, were traditionally fishermen in Ghana. So we do have a very strong relationship with the sea. Mm and salt, you salt fish to store it. You know, there's, um, the, there are parts in Accra where we kind of, you win salt, you know, in, 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 um, in kind of um, swampy, salty areas and stuff like that. So there's a lot of salt around. Um, and when we were growing up, one of the, the chants you would hear on the street and, in, 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 you know, during the day is people selling salt. Um, and you just hear, yes, table salt, table salt, table salt. So there's, there's a lot of salt, I guess, in my subconscious. Um, but I've also, again, you know, so I often say this to people and, and they're surprised because I'm such a, a model agnostic now. Um, <laughs> when I was, <laughs> um, when I was um, you know, around 13, 14, I actually, you know, I was heavily into the Bible. I used to preach and stuff like that, you know. Um, I feel like all good poets start that I was in the church. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Um, and, um, but you know, the story of Lot's wife was always like a weird one for me because I'm, I'm also so logical. So I'm like, so who could tell she turned to salt? Because if you look back, you turn to salt, right? So that's why that whole thing about it being rumor. And so, you know, there are all kinds of things I, I you know, yeah. I was always the kid who was like, no, nah, that story doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, so I think I was already primed before I made Muslim and Buddhist friends to kind of question the whole thing and, and the fire and damnation and um, yeah. And also, you know, you, you sweat a lot <laughs> in Ghana. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I am going to ask you to read Caress 8 as a way of moving us from this section of the body into the final, which is emotion feeling. And for that, I'm gonna, we're looking at intimacy. So if you could read Caress 8 as a way of turning us into, from the body into intimacy. You, you have lived with these poems. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Caress 8. Absence is silence he has learned to endure, but sometimes it breaks his faith in his own existence, makes him rephrase questions. If a tree falls in a forest and you don't hear it, do you exist? 
Maybe this is why he hums against the wood of his own headboard. Why it is no surprise that Amazing Grace is the song an agnostic chooses to learn to play on his new trumpet. Because it has a history that will see him pass the clumsy blast of air, he tries to tame into something more than noise, something recognizable, something he has heard his mother sing before with notes his father played, words alive in the hymn book that survived his grandmother, a chain that holds them all, a link that keeps everyone present in his struggle, free as wind, breath. One day his children will laugh at him when he stumbles demonstrating a somersault and falls with a thud of soft fruit in the morning. He will chase them in mock fury and try again. And soon he will find ways of teaching them things he can no longer do himself. Like seed begat bud and bud flower, a chain unbroken. Even talents that have slept within him like French double L's, alleles in the helix of his life, he will pass on, easy as the caress that stripped their mother's body, simple as a song that beyond silence lives on. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to offer that if the body is the mechanism you use to give us an access, then intimacy is the intention. An exploration of intimacy, a probing, a teasing out, an opening up, an unfolding and unfurling. And I want to start with an intimacy that spans continents and generations and a conversation that we don't have often enough. Um, and maybe before we go there, just to say, the book really sits with intimacy in all its forms between mm. parent and child, um, between friends, between lovers, um, between self and the world, between self and history and, and the intimacies between inanimate things um, and between kind of things that we can't touch, intangible things, but that are so deeply um, impacting on our lives, our histories, our stories. Um, and so I want to start with an intimacy, like I said, that spans continents and generations. And one that in the book you say yourself is a conversation that we don't have often enough. Yeah. The relationship between those of us from the continent and our family in the diaspora. And so to kind of start that conversation, I'm going to ask if you could read from the 11 page letter to Anyemi Akpa. And if you could read parts um, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, and eleven. And okay. I know this might stretch us for time, but I feel each of those particular sections speak to this, this, um, this conversation quite directly, and it would give yeah. us quite you know, a bit to hang off. So. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so it's four to eight, and then ten and eleven. Exactly. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, four. F wind, water. Your totems hum still in the shrines we nested in trees before ill winds blew white sheets to anchor cargoes of wood and breathing greed of our warm shores. Did we guess or did we know to riddle our prayers into the pores of the earth herself? The river ciphered slick with warnings. They began with mirrors, changeable as their skins under sun before they looted masks with empty eyes, hollow songs stretch goat skin under untutored hands. Dead goats on their own cannot bleat the drum's message. All the earth's miles can't sever song from your tongue. I see your offspring dance our river's skin. Fire. I will not speak of fire. You did not burn. Let me. Fire is also invitation. You change the tone in another blood. In a third, fire is your father. It's not prestidigitation that smoke casts shadows. You are the invisible man, Anyemi. The woman at the back of a bus. I am the one who reclaimed my name. I am my father's second son. If I am missing, the first will be questioned. This is how our absence was marked. Girls and boys eating with twin names, 
no one to watch. Fingers squeezing otto, but too distracted to know it's fire. An antelope with a single antler carries pain in the neck. Six bones. Achingly, a folded wing, I'm a boomerang in black soil. Before I returned to the hem of our rivers, I believed we had been forgotten. But how could we be? We are words falling from a language, coral on the tongue, stuck in the line of fiber octave bones marrowing the Atlantic. Pentatonic notes are key clue. Listen to the melody. The heart is an aviary, its treasure of birds not always visible, but look at these bright feathers we flag into gay fabric. Lord led now we on school, lies woven into our daily routine to learn again the languages that will teach us to dance the dance of twins, the dance of Ibusian as army. Seven, paper. Some mornings, my eyes water with your wounds. All the tiny hairs that must have taunted the flames before they spread their tongues on your skin. I am free because you are smoke. I think of memory as retained folds in paper that once was origami. I think of memory as layers and onion holds. Both of them fade in heat, but something lingers. This be the twist of DNA that syllabled ebonics. Any rapper will know this, that language is paper, that onions turn translucent, but colored stay green. I'm applauding you from out here, money. Mo, 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 mo. I don't know what happened, but I'm back. Okay. Okay, so I'll start that section again. Eight, language. When we pour snaps on the earth, when you tip liquor onto concrete, it does not trickle into graves. There's a place called Sersani where the trees bloom with hindsight. This is where our dear departed sit, ancestors side by side with boys assassinated for skin crimes. This is Africa. This is America. Anyame and sisters have been showing them the charts on spooling the con. In that world, darkness defines kinship, not language. Remember the snippets of that song of Solomon, because I am black, our bed is green. Through the lattice, language is lattice. We are whole behind it. And it's 10, 11. Mm -hmm. 10 remains. If we have so many words for family, how can you be gone? Bre, anyemi, omanfo, how were we broken? I am thinking now of subtraction. Perhaps that is the unspoken angle, the unused eye. The one whose fortune it is to stay behind may be as blessed as cursed. For what becomes of the remainder after the division? That little R stuck to its side like a scar while the rest take the scar. Breaking that beat money, nobody is taken without family left behind. No chariot rolls without leaving tracks. There are tears in our wake enough to raise Jordan. The sea between us is common salt. 11, Helix. Listen, Ma, if between rainy days and blue skies, some fool asks you to prove it, don't bother with ancestry websites. I know by the way you walk, you took fire for me. I can hear your voice in the I can hear in your voice the drums they forbade you to play. Our unspoken pact was to somehow survive. So hold my hands now, Ace, and let's reshuffle. Throw out the balm of forgetting, read the boomerangs marked hide. You are no longer an antelope alone. We are an entire herd. You can wade in the water. I'm looking out for you. My antlers like yours are an 11 on the head. Multiplied, we equal one to one. One to one, let's unravel helices. 
Let's talk. Mm. Thank you. So I guess for people who don't speak um, any of the Ghanaian languages, various words, slangs for addressing family members. Mm. Thank you. So that poem ends on Let's Talk. And the question I want to ask is, what is this conversation that you feel needs to be had? How do you think we begin that conversation? And how could intimacy, which is what this poem really mm -hmm. deals with, how, does, how can intimacy change the kind of conversation that might be possible? <sighs> I think the first part of the conversation, I mean, so this is, a topic that's always been close to me because of my family history. My, um, I have a, an English surname, which is not common in Ghana. Um, and that is because um, my great grandfather came in um, to Sierra Leone from, my great great grandfather came into Sierra Leone from Jamaica, bringing with him his son from Guadeloupe. Um, my, from that line, they also married, um, a Nova Scotian, there were Nova Scotians also that settled in Sierra Leone. Now the Nova Scotians are the people who fought on the side of the British in the American War of Independence for the promise of being taken back to Africa. So I have ancestry out in the diaspora, but I was lucky to grow up in Ghana. And when I say lucky, I say lucky purely on a linguistic level. I have a language other than English in which to explore this experience. And I think that's the first thing. As long as we understand that as long as, if we're talking about these things in the languages that colonized us, we're never going to be in a good place to speak about these things. But a good starting point is to remember that no family is taken wholesale. So for everyone that was taken, somebody was left behind that was crying for them. And there's a trauma that remains on the continent that we don't speak about because we have also been taught that our emergence from post-colonialism is to forget and just claw back and get money, right? But there are these traumas that we're not talking about. And so I grew up with a taboo not to whistle when it gets dark, for instance, right? And I always thought it was odd. And I was traveling, um, in the central region of Ghana. And when I spoke to one of the elders, they said, oh, it's because people got kidnapped. Now, when I was growing up, I was just told it was a taboo. You just don't whistle. And I didn't understand it. But now putting that together, I realized this is because people knew that people were kidnapping people to be shipped abroad as slaves. So we, we have taboos that tell us that we need to be fearful. Um, and we haven't, process that so these traumas are there and we need to process them so I think the first thing and the first step that is easy to do that's easy to do is for us to know that there, there is the remainder mm -hmm. so let's not go with the narrative of you sold us you left us behind because even the narrative the the idea that we are kin because of the color of our skins is a new thing that came after exploitation of course, having reached where we are, we just have to accept it. But our intertwining relationships were governed by something way more complex than the color of skin. Um, and yeah, so these are the conversations, they are conversations we need to have, which is why the poem ends on let's talk because I don't have the answers. I only have the will to talk and the desire to talk. And, and you know, because I don't want my children to grow up not knowing or not understanding the complexity of this heritage um, and not having empathy for either side, you know, and I think is vitally important. It's, it's really powerful and it makes me think of, so I'm in Cape Town in South Africa and there's a long, there's, there's a, a history of enslavement at this, at, at this site. People yes, brought yes. from Angola, from East Africa, from Indonesia, from Bali, um, you know, and, and the evidence of that is in our family surnames. So 
we have many surnames like May, September, February, March, because people were given the names in which they were handed over, you know, for money. Mm. And and the thing, and I and I spent some time in Kenya in in January and spent time in a place called Shimoni, and there are caves that have site, which is kind of a, a historical site where people were kept before they were taken to Dar es Salaam and then to Antananarivo and then kind of, you know, moved around, mm. um, captured and moved around. And some of them ended up in Cape Town and I didn't know that. And so when you're talking about the trauma, the thing, the thing that I often think about is like what this land holds mm. that we have not begun to do any of our ritual work around to heal yeah. because our rights and ways of healing were, de- were, were, were demonized through religion, through Christianity. And so how the trauma that lives in the soil in Ghana is this, it, it like impacts the trauma that lives in the soil in Kenya and on the coast of Mombasa, impacts the trauma that lives on the soil of Cape Town. And so how there's the holding on this side and then there's what happens across the ocean in the Caribbean, in North America, in the sea itself. And and so this and so we're, and so what's powerful for me about that let's talk is that when you open up that conversation, it can seem like you're extending it across the Atlantic, but what you're actually doing is extending it back to all of us as well, yeah. for all of our shared interwoven histories of the soil, like it's the same soil and what and and you know in in um, a what's the poem called uh, the history of geography um, a concise history of geography. When you talk about the Berlin concise Conference, geography of heartbreak. A good concise <laughs> geography of heartbreak. Yeah. When you talk about the Berlin Conference, mm-hmm. um, what they successfully did was indoctrinate our minds to make us believe that 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 that, that we are separate. Yeah. But we know that how our spirituality and our connection to the land works is that everything is the same. It's one and the same. And so this is such a powerful poem, and it's it's. I just think it's something that that we really need to sit with. And, you know, I want to encourage people on all sides to pull it out and to like work with it and to start having those conversations in any way that we can. Um, yeah. Um, so to end my last question, and I'm aware that we're slightly over time, but I it's hope that fine. people are, <laughs> are okay and still with us. Um, the collection starts, and I love that about game. I loved how there was this, um, it start, the collection actually starts with the intimacy of family life through play and moves back and forth between intimacy between lovers, parent and child. And it does so very effortlessly. This, that's, what, that's what I loved also. There was this effortless move of different, between different kinds of intimacy, often within the same poem. Um, if we go back to thinking about of serendipity and the gimbal of blackness that you did at the start, those are really clear examples. And so I'd like you to, um, to ask you to please read how I know. Of course. Um, how I know is, uh, well, it's named after a song by the Irish Factor. I, I have this tradition of naming poems after songs. And actually the other thing that's right through the collection is music because I grew up very much around music um, and it really influences the way I see the world um, and experience the world. Um, we so. need a whole hour just for that. I couldn't, I had to, I, <laughs> yeah. I had to, I had to, I had to choose to not discuss. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how I know, and it starts with a little um, quote from the song. I smile a little more than I did before. That's how I know love, our age factor some memory of darkness, soft expanses of ebony and flesh that turned liquid on my tongue in the clasp of infant gums. A body that moved to soothe me, a body with shoulders angled to support leaning. Notes hidden like silverfish in the creases of my books, six-year-old fingers turning care perfect Ds, surprise declarations that drop out on stages Reminding me that I've birthed a girl with heart, a child who knows healing. The smell of almond and shea butter in the hair of an embrace. The sound of trains passing, a glut of air as tunnels fill with weight. Slow breath, 
as I try to hold a moment that feels like one that shouldn't pass. We're skin to skin at the cheek. A boy's smile that emerges as his mother's door closes, his hands reaching for the learned angle of my shoulder, the circumference of my neck, soon in the clasp of his thighs, monkey bar antics fading as a girl warms my cheek with her small hand. This is how my dad felt, perhaps. All I remember is fleeting, but I recall the scratch of a pin on shellac, the wound of Mahalia's voice rising to fill a house, the weight of his arm around my neck, the whisper of a smile moving the wood of his skin, his voice saying, listen. In the poetry section of a bookshop, my hand in the crease of an anthology of Brazilian poets, lost in the black joy of word after apt word, I lift my eyes and see the woman who said yes to dinner. She moves and my mouth is wide. Between us, a field of teeth straining to do more than just smile. Mm. Thank you. And so I'd like to ask you to talk to us about these movements between these intimacies, how they and how and why they meld together for you so effortlessly, because that's what they they feel like. They feel effortless, mm. this movement between one kind of intimacy and the next. Um, I think as I've grown older, um, the... I mean, the main thing that's happened as I've grown older or as I've <laughs> distanced myself from, from um, very biblical interpretations of what intimacy is, is that I, I find lots of similarities um, in the intimacies that are considered romantic, very physical intimacies, and the intimacies of family and friends, you know, um, because touch is touch. If we separate body parts out of it, touch is touch, right? Um, and I think I've, I've become very comfortable with that. It, it also means I'm very comfortable with my friends and being tender with my friends. Um, and I've learned through um, heartbreak to be more forgiving and more tender and, and more, more of a listener. And all of these things are part of intimacy. You know, part of intimacy is, is, is forgiveness. Um, it's a huge part of intimacy. And um, so I guess with becoming aware of that in, in whatever ways that has happened has also allowed these sections to overlap. And so the movements happen because a hand on the neck can mean so many different things depending on whose hand it is and what what the moment is right so um yeah um i think i think it's just a growing a thing of, of growth and it's it's a weird thing because on one level sometimes we don't want to grow so fast but there's also a joy in 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 growing into your wisdom um or yeah just fully accepting yourself and I think that's, that's, that's what the journey is, you know? I'm beginning to understand more and more why, why the old ladies, um, you know, at family parties were just so straight and raw because they're like, you know what? Life is simple enough. As complex as it is, as it is it's also a very simple thing. You know, we're here to, to love as much as we can, to smile as much as we can, and to, to make each other's lives better because otherwise, why would you want to make it harder? <laughs> right yeah and I think that's pretty much the journey thank you Nee. thank you so much thank you so much Tony I mean I I know you're in the middle of writing an epic and you've <laughs> taken the time to to do this and um thank you I love it and thank you for everyone who's watching and everyone who's going to watch afterwards um mm -hmm. this has been my first kind of experiment of, of um of doing this um, live thing and um, yeah thank you and also, can we just tell everyone the book is out today it's publication oh yes it's it's Please out today buy. It's, on Amazon. <laughs> it's in bookstores the gays um, published by people tree press thank you so much thank you thank you and we'll continue this conversation 
another time in person, I hope soon. Mm -hmm.